Okay. Uh, hi, guys. Um, as Catherine was saying, I am Mike Deroff. I am a software engineer at Tengen, and Tengen is the company that sponsors the development of MongoDB, and, and we provide support and services for built around MongoDB. Um, so a little bit more about my background is that what I do specifically at Tengen is a lot of work on driver development for MongoDB. So especially uh, a lot of Python support. So for those of you who are using MongoDB with Python, um, you might have seen my name with commits and, and things like that. Um, yeah, and I'm also working on the O'Reilly uh, MongoDB, the definitive guide, which is scheduled to come out in September with my coworker, Christina. So you guys should definitely check that out as well. Um, and a little bit about this presentation, uh, what we're going to do here is sort of a general introduction to MongoDB. Um, and in the past, the way I've structured this has been to do sort of a section about motivating MongoDB and, and why you might be interested in MongoDB and, and how it might be useful for your projects. And then talk a little bit about uh, some of the features that that's, might separate MongoDB from some other systems. and and I've gotten into a sample application. And so what I think I'm, I'm going to change it up a little bit this time, and we're going to, as I'm describing new features, I'll sh try to show some example code that, that shows how you might actually work with those features in MongoDB. So it's a little bit different like I've done it than I've done it in the past, and hopefully that uh, works out well. So as Catherine was saying, let me know if you have any questions um, throughout, and we'll try to get to all of them. OK, so I think that. Um, to start, to introduce sort of the space that MongoDB is in, I think it's important to note that what we've seen recently is sort of this trend towards specialization in uh, the database market. So we're seeing um, no longer so much of a one-size-fits-all approach to storing and dealing with data, and we're seeing different types of databases that are being used to attack different types of problems. So. Uh, I have three sort of segments. This is one way that you could possibly break down the database market um, right now. And so we have the traditional relational database. That's things like Oracle and MySQL. We have what I'm calling here this next generation OLAP databases. That's things like Vertica and Astrodata and Greenplum. And then uh, lastly, and this is where MongoDB would be, uh, we have this category of non-relational operational stores. And that's what um, a lot of people are, are calling these things NoSQL databases. So what does NoSQL actually mean? And I think that um, we can probably all agree that, that NoSQL is probably a, a misnomer for a lot of reasons. And, and maybe it's more negative than it should be towards SQL or towards traditional relational databases. But what it really means, or, or at least what I mean when I say NoSQL, is non-relational next generation operational data stores and databases. So these are databases that are designed for the web and they're attacking uh, some of the problems that the traditional relational databases have had when they're being used for web applications. Um, and so the, I think the biggest problem that these things are all trying to solve is scaling out. And so I think sort of one unifying theme of all of these NoSQL databases is that they have horizontally scalable architectures. And in general, what that means is that with any of these things, you're, you're probably giving up on joins. You're giving up on the ability to do joins. And you're giving up on the ability to do complex, multi-row transactions. And I think that's pretty much true across the board. And so once we've given up on these two things in order to allow for a horizontally scalable architecture, so the reason we have to give up on those is because it's hard to implement both of those things when we're scaling horizontally across many machines or nodes. And so once we've given up on those two things, uh, we've given up on the relational data model. So it also gives us the chance to design a new data model or to think about uh, experimenting with new data models. And this could lead, you could imagine that this could lead to improved ways to developing applications. And I think that that's actually what we've seen. So um, I think one of the big reasons that, that the NoSQL space and MongoDB um, have become so popular recently or have, have gotten so much traction recently is because people are excited about 
the ability to scale out. So it's that, it's that scaling that has sort of caused the initial excitement. But I think what people have seen, especially with MongoDB, is that um, while, while the promise of scalability is nice, it actually can be a lot easier to work with MongoDB than with a traditional relational database. So even for small scale applications, I think that um, a lot of people are starting to think about using MongoDB for those as well. And, and we'll talk about why that is. So given this opportunity to choose a new data model, there have been a, a bunch of different choices that have been made in this NoSQL space. Um, that seems to be pretty popular are key value stores. And that's a, that's a pretty simple data model. Um, you basically get to associate a, a key with a value and you, you can do operations like put a new value for some given key or get the value for a key or maybe delete a key entirely. Um, and these are things like memcached, so memcached is a non-relational database. It has some interesting properties to it. Um, but, you know, at its core, that's what it is. Um, then sort of a next level up from that is this tabular data model. And that's um, the data model that you'll see if, if you do something like read the big table data paper. So that's sort of the, the origin of that data model, or that's where that became popular, um, is in Google's big table. And the tabular data model is sort of a hybrid between uh, a columnar and a row or in a database. So it, it's, it's definitely uh, interesting. And I think that sort of the next step pushing it further away from the relational model is this document oriented approach. And that's what MongoDB uses and also things like CouchDB use, use that approach as well. And we'll talk about exactly what that means and, and how that changes the way that you can think about developing applications as we go on. Okay, so I'd like to show this chart um, when I talk about MongoDB. MongoDB because I think it um, does a good job of quickly summarizing what our goals are with the MongoDB project. So you can see over here on the left, I have um, scalability and performance and all the way up at the top, you know, sort of the most high performing uh, data storage on the chart here is, is memcached. Um, but then on the bottom, we have depth of functionality. So you can see that memcache is sort of to the left there. And, you know, that's because when you're using, for those of you who have worked with memcache before, you know, keys can get evicted without, um, without you knowing about it. So it's not really persistent um, in the way that a lot of these other things are. And so, you know, it, it maybe lacks some of the functionality you'd want in terms of a general purpose web data store. And then uh, on the other side of things, we have the relational database. So the relational database lets you do joins and it lets you do complex multi-row transactions and it lets you do basically, you know, any functionality you, you could possibly want from a database. Um, but as we've seen, um, as, as the web grows and web applications grow, we've seen that it, it sometimes is not capable of delivering the, the types of scalability and the type of performance that we uh, need from our data store. And so with MongoDB, really what we're trying to do is get the scalability and performance of a key value store and then push as far to the right as we can in terms of functionality. So to get as much of that functionality that you'd expect from a relational database as possible. Um, and, and you'll see that throughout a lot of the decisions that we've made. So um, let's start by answering what's missing. So we, we've already talked about this a little bit. But what's, what's missing with MongoDB compared to a relational database are the, the most notable things are joins. So we don't support joins and complex multi-row transactions. So we don't support um, you know, that sort of thing either. Also, we don't support SQL. I think um, that's sort of a less important note. I'll, I'll show you how queries work in MongoDB. We have our own sort of document-based query language. Um, but I think as you'll see, uh, through the queries that I'll show you here, and if you get more into some of the MongoDB documentation, I, I think you'll see that what you can do with the MongoDB query language is pretty similar to the types of queries you can do with SQL, and there's really not too much of a reason why, uh, why we couldn't support SQL. or some subset of SQL in the long run. So I think um, important note decision anyway. So, uh, look first, uh, because I'm going to throw around these words, I wanted to cover some basic terminology. Um, 
So when I say database, you can think of that, if you're used to relational databases, you can think of that as basically exactly what we mean when we say a database in MySQL, say. So a database is sort of an independent uh, set of data. Generally, people tend to create a database for a given application. Um, a, each database in MongoDB is complete, stored completely independently on disk, so they're sort of an independent unit. Um, but a single server can have multiple databases. And when I say collection, that's sort of the equivalent of a table in a relational database. So there's some differences semantically between a collection and a table, and that's why we have a different term for it. Um, and I'll talk about sort of the biggest difference in two slides, I think. Um, but that's what I mean. So when I say collection, and I'm sure that I will throw that, that word around a bit, you can, you can sort of translate it to table if you're coming from the relational database world. And finally, document. So a document is sort of the MongoDB equivalent of a row. It's the unit of data storage. So when you insert something into the database, you're inserting a new document. And when you get something back from the database, you're getting back a document. And we'll see exactly what a document uh, looks like right now. So MongoDB uses JSON-style documents. Um, and this is that that style qualifier is important here. So we don't actually use JSON anywhere internally, really. Uh, so we sort of think of them conceptually as JSON-like data. Um, so example, on syntax here. Um, but what actually happens internally is that we send that to the server and we store that in the database in this format called BSON. And BSON stands for JSON. The actual the spec for the BSON format is available online. It's at bsonspec.org. You can see the link in the in the lower right there. So you can feel free to check that out. It's it's a good general purpose serialization format. There are um, there are some goals that are sort of BSON specific there, um, so we try to keep it lightweight, but we also try to keep it uh, very traversable, so easy for the database to sort of skip around within a document. So we put in things like length prefixes in front of strings where we might not need them um, if we were just trying to make the format as lightweight as possible. But you can see, so this, this document, Hello World, is going to get converted to the string of bytes that I have here below, um, which is the equivalent BSON representation. So you're really never working with JSON. You're working with uh, data structures in your programming language. So in JavaScript, you're working with objects. In Python, you're working with dictionaries. In Ruby, you're working with hashes. Um, in PHP, you're working with arrays, associative arrays. And then you're taking those objects, those programming language level objects, and you are, they're being converted for you by the driver into this BSON format. Um, but it, it's helpful to think of it as similar to JSON. That makes it a little bit easier to uh, reason about or talk about. And sort of the other important note about documents in MongoDB is that there really are no predefined schemas. Um, so this is sort of the big difference between a collection and a table. So, you know, with a table in a relational database, we would have to, you know, manually create that table and specify what, uh, the, you know, what type we're going to use for each column. And with MongoDB, we don't need to do anything like that. So we can take any document. So here are two different documents. The first one has an author and some text, and the second one has an author and some text and an array of tags or a list of tags. And both of those documents could be saved in the same collection. So we never have to say this is what the documents are going to look like in my collection and we actually don't even need to explicitly create the collection. Um, you can do that if you want, you can pre-create collections if you want, but actually the first time you save a document into a collection it will implicitly create that collection since there is no need for a predefined schema. Um, I think the other interesting note about documents that we can see from this example is with that tags field. So you can see the tags field is actually um, sort of a complex data type there. It's a, it's a list. So documents support um, some things that can be 
more complex structurally than a row in a relational database. So we can support things like lists of values, and we can also support actual embedded documents. You could imagine having, um, and we'll see an example of this later, but you could imagine having a field or a key whose value is actually another whole document, another whole set of key value pairs. And so you can sort of have these nested structures like that. And that's um, one of the ways that docu this document-oriented approach really gives you some flexibility versus a relational database. Okay, so let's see um, how this actually looks with code. So the code that I'm going to show here is in, written in JavaScript. And the reason I've, I've chosen JavaScript is um, sort of a long and winding story. But basically, MongoDB supports JavaScript in a bunch of interesting ways. So we support um, the main with the data. So it's actually a full JavaScript intent. And we also support JavaScript on the server side in a bunch of different places. Um, so all the examples of code here are written in JavaScript that you could run in the shell. So if you download MongoDB and fire up the shell, you could run this example. Um, JavaScript is also pretty easy to translate into any of the other languages. So the APIs tend to look very similar. Um, for example, if you wanted to convert this, exam this example into Python, you would just add some quotes around the key names, and, and then it would be a dictionary, and it would you know, pretty much work as is. So um, anyway, this is how we could create a blog post. So here we're, we're representing our post document with an author key, a date key, um, some text, and some tags. And you can see, again, those, that tags is an array. So it's sort of a more complex data structure than you might have uh, in a row in a relational database. If this is a relational database, you might have a separate tags table, and you might do a join, uh, you know, a many-to-many -many join to, to have a post with its tags. Um, and here, we're just going to take those tags and embed them directly within the post document. Um, another interesting thing here is that because we use BSON, we support some more complex types than you might uh, be used to with JSON. So, for example, with JSON, there's no date type. Um, with BSON, we've added a date type. So, you know, dates are pretty important for a database, and so we have an explicit type that gets supported and converted to the native date type in whatever programming language you're using. Um, so this is how you create a date in JavaScript, but that would, that would convert to whatever other language you're using. Um, and then, so to actually insert that post, we just do db.post.save. And that db.post thing is a collection. So that is um, going to implicitly, if, if there already isn't a post collection, that is going to implicitly create a post collection uh, in whatever database we're using. And it's going to save that post into that collection. Um, so that's, you know, sort of the most basic way to do an, an insert um, into MongoDB. OK. Things are, sorry, things are slowing down here, so I skipped a uh, slide. Um, OK, so one important note about doing that insert is that there's a special key in MongoDB called underscore ID. And when we do that insert, before we actually send the document to the MongoDB server, we are going to add a key to it called underscore ID. So you can see, again, there is no underscore ID key here, and we're going to add it. And that's because MongoDB expects every document to have a unique underscore ID key. So it's basically a primary key for your document. If you have a key that you want to use as your primary key, um, so if you have a user's collection and you want to use username as your unique primary key, that will work. So you, you can manually set underscore ID to be any type you want. But if you don't add one, we're going to add this object ID type for you. And you can see here it's made up of a timestamp and a machine ID and a process ID and, and an incrementing counter. Um, but basically, it's you can think of it as similar to a GUID. And we'll add that uh, to any document that doesn't already have an underscore ID. Um, and this isn't too imp this is sort of a technical note. It's not too important when you're getting started, but uh, it might show up later on in the slides. And, and so just wanted to talk about it quick so that nobody gets confused about it. 
Okay, so the next uh, important feature, or defining feature of MongoDB is that it supports dynamic queries. So it actually has, you know, it's pretty similar to what you'd expect with a relational database. So there's a dynamic uh, query language. Um, right, so Tom, yeah, that's glad that that helped. So yeah, underscore ID is not a hash. It's, it's basically just comprised of these four components. And that's how we can guarantee uniqueness, even though we're generating it on different uh, machines. So MongoDB does support dynamic queries, and we'll, we'll show some examples of what the query language looks like. And hopefully, I will convey how easy it is to work with. So it tends to be pretty easy to work with and very flexible and powerful So um, to do sort of advanced queries. So here's a little bit about how that works. So if we want to find all the posts with the author Mike, the way we would do that is we just send a, a, a new document that sort of looks like the documents that we're trying to match. So we just send a new document here with just the author key set to Mike. And that's going to say to the server, send me back all the posts who have the author Mike. Um, and this find method is actually sort of the um, run a query method with, with MongoDB. Um, so it's pretty simple to do uh, queries like that. We can also do some more advanced things, like we can tack on sorts or limits or skips. And the way that this works, so here what we're going to do is we're going to find the last 10 posts, and we're going to do it by doing an empty find. So we don't give it any document, and that means return me all of the documents. And we're going to sort by date descending. So we're going to sort um, you know, in reverse order of date, and we're going to limit it to the first 10 results. And the way that this works is that find doesn't actually run the query immediately, so it's sort of lazy. So when you call find, it returns a cursor instance. And then that cursor instance has methods like sort and limit define that we can sort of tack on to the query. And then only when we iterate over the cursor do we actually send the query to the server. So that's how this is actually working. Um, it's sort of a little bit lazy on the client side. So in order to do more advanced queries, we have this document-based query language. So let's say that we wanted to get all the posts since August 1st. The way we do that is we construct a new date that represents August 1st, and then we use this dollar sign GT operator, which stands for greater than, um, to find all dates that are greater than that August 1st date. And so this is... Um, you know, this is sort of the way that we'd represent more complex queries with MongoDB is by having all these different dollar sign operators, and there are a whole bunch of them. So we can do things like find me all posts where the tag count modulo five is two. So we can do really complex stuff with this uh, with this dollar sign query language. Um, I'm going to answer Ronald's question real quickly. I'll get to the rest of them, but Ronald. Yes, August is 8, but JavaScript is stupid, not you. So JavaScript starts at 0 for months and starts at 1 for everything else. So uh, that's just the way it would be with JavaScript. It's sort of strange. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of how we can do more complex queries with MongoDB. Um, and it tends to be pretty nice and pretty easy to work with from uh, any given programming language. So just like we have dollar sign uh, query modifiers, we also have dollar sign update modifiers. So there's all sorts of complex functionality that we can use um, to do atomic updates in MongoDB. And this is sort of one approach that we take to get around the fact that we don't have transactions. So we try to make, uh, to expose sort of complex functionality through this update language, basically, these update modifiers. Um, to let you work around the fact that there aren't transactions. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to take this comment that we've created. I'm calling it C here. And you can see my comments just have an author and a date and some text. And we're going to take that comment and we're going to push it onto an array um, in our post. So we're going to create, we're actually, in this case, we're going to create a new comments array. So uh, there weren't any comments in our original post that we saved. And we're going to create a new comments and array, and we're going to populate it with this one comment here. And we can do express all of that functionality with just this dollar sign push operator. So what this update is actually saying is the first document uh, that I'm passing to update is the query select.
selector, it's sort of saying what document do I want to update? And I want to update the document whose underscore ID is post dot underscore ID. So that underscore ID, if you remember, was a unique identifier that we added to the post when we saved it. So we're going to update the document that we saved. And we're going to update it by pushing a new comment C onto the comments array. And we could do the same update from multiple processes at the same time. And there's sort of no contention that we need to worry about there. So the first update that goes through would create the comments array. And as new updates come through, they'll just keep appending to the end of that array a new comment. Um, so we don't really need to worry about uh, locking the document or doing anything like that. Um, but that's sort of how we can express some of that more complex functionality with a simple update modifier. And again, just like for queries, there are a whole ton of these things. So there are update modifiers to do increments, which are useful for things like real-time analytics. Um, and there are update modifiers to uh, set new fields and do all sorts of complicated updates to your documents. OK, so MongoDB also supports uh, indexing, secondary indexes, and it's actually very familiar to you guys if you're coming from something like MySQL. So we use B-tree indexes, we can do compound key indexes, um, and it's pretty much the, the performance characteristics, the behavior is pretty similar to uh, relational database indexes in general. Um, there are a couple notes here. So one note is that we do what, what are called multi-key indexes, which I guess is terminology that we, we pretty much made up here. Um, but what that means is that if you remember that tags, that tags key was actually an array of values. So there was like three or four strings that were each a tag in the tags array. And when we create an index, this is the function we would call ensure index, and that, that will create an index on tags. And when we create that index, um, what we're actually going to do is in key that document in the in the index on each of those tags. So then that lets us do a query like give me all of the posts with the tag MongoDB and we'll actually use the index for that. So so that's that multi-key thing. We'll actually put the document in the index with multiple keys for every value in the array. Um, so that's sort of an interesting feature. It lets you do some sort of basic uh, fake full text search type stuff uh, pretty easily. So another interesting indexing thing is this embedded document. So uh, we just added a comment to our post. And so we have this comments array. And each of those comments has an author field. And so we can actually index into that array and sort of reach inside of those embedded documents and index on that author field. And the way we denote that is by using this dot notation. So we say comments.author. And that sort of means reach into the comments array and look at the author field. And then we can also query by that as well. So uh, this, this query here, comments.author is Elliot, is going to look for all posts who have an author, uh, a comment with the author Elliot. And that'll use the index if we've created it. So that's sort of, uh, this dot notation is sort of important. And it's basically uh, how we denote reaching into an embedded document. OK, one second here. Um, so this is uh, sort of a meta feature, I guess. But MongoDB does support many uh, different platforms and languages. So there are drivers written for PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, Java, C++, C, C Sharp, .NET, um, Erlang, Haskell, you name it. So, so we support almost you know any language you can think of. And we also support a bunch of different platforms. So we actually run our builds every night on Windows 32 and 64-bit, Linux 32 and 64-bit, OS X 32 and 64-bit, Solaris, uh, FreeBSD. So sort of you name it, it's supported there. So there's a, there's a, lot, um, there's a lot of support for you know, any different setup that you might have. Um, and another sort of meta note that, that I wanted to make is that MongoDB does have a heavy focus on performance. So a lot of the decisions that we've made have been made um, in order to guarantee you know, high performance. So these are things like we don't use REST to talk to the database. Um, you know, some, a, a bunch of other you know, newer databases have chosen to use HTTP REST to, as sort of the primary uh, communication protocol between clients and the database server. And we don't. We actually use a binary TCP wire protocol. And uh, that's just always going to be faster than, than talking over REST. Um, 
Other decisions we've made are that by default, writes don't actually wait for a response for the, from the database. So by default, when you call insert or update or remove to delete a, a document, um, that's just going to be sort of a fire and forget operation. So the client will connect and send the write, and then it'll you know go on and do the next thing without actually waiting for the server to respond. So that lets you do uh, some really interesting things here. So you could actually think about using MongoDB for doing things like logging per request or doing things like um, real-time analytics, so doing multiple updates every time somebody hits a web page. And those can actually be, you know, reasonable because uh, we, we don't actually wait for response on every single one of those things. Um, so you can get some really high performance out of it. But, you know, it's, it's basically just important to keep in mind that this is a, this is a goal, so MongoDB tends to perform pretty well um, because it's something we've designed for. Um, Okay, so let's talk about some more interesting features of Mongo uh, quickly. So replica sets are something that we've added recently in uh, the most recent stable version of Mongo, which is 1.6. Um, and what replica sets are, are basically similar to, to master-slave replication. Um, but you can see here I'm using some different terminology. So instead of saying master, I'm saying primary. And instead of saying slave, I'm saying secondary. Um, and that's a decision we made not because it's more PC, but because uh, the primary can actually change in a replica set. So there's sort of no one single master node. There's at any given time, there's a primary node, and that's where writes are going. Um, but that can change. So in this case, we start with our primary as this middle node. And then in the second sort of uh, group here, the primary has gone offline. Um, and what will then happen is that the remaining nodes will sort of elect a new primary. They'll elect a new node to take over uh, for writes. And here we can see the node on the left has gotten elected. And so the other node has started to pull updates from there. And then finally, in the last slide, the original primary comes back online and it picks up sort of right where it left off, uh, pulling updates from the new primary node on the left. So basically, the idea with replica sets is that it's very similar to traditional master-slave replication with this automatic failover element. Um, and so what happens there is that the clients also support this. So when you're talking to a replica set from a driver, the driver will sort of automatically fail over and start talking to a new primary when it sees that there's been a switch like this. Um, so these are, these are really interesting. Uh, setup and you know it lets you do some sort of comp complicated things and uh, can remove some of the administrative burden that you might deal with with sort of traditional master slave replication but this is fully supported now and this is sort of uh, I think probably the recommended way for setting up a replication with MongoDB going forward so you can still do master slave but I think uh, probably most people will be using this replica set mechanism um, and the, another interesting thing that has come out recently is this auto sharding stuff and auto sharding is MongoDB's path to scaling out to huge volumes or to um, really intense write loads. And so what we do with auto sharding is we actually split up the data. So with replication, the same data is copied to all of the nodes in the replica set. And with sharding, we, we actually split up the data so that certain shards, which are you know groups of nodes, so it could be a replica set, it could be a master slave cluster, but each shard is responsible for some subset of the data. And we have this process called MongoS that distributes queries and distributes writes to whichever shard is responsible for a given document. Um, and so what this lets you do is sort of treat uh, this scale out as transparent to the client. So the client still talks to this MongoS as if it was talking to a single node. Um, but behind the scenes, we're actually splitting that splitting up that load across many different nodes um, and, and distributing inserts that way. So this is, uh, for large scale, this is really interesting. And this is in production now in a couple different places. Um, it's actually been in the works for a long time now, but 1.6 is when we finally declared it production ready. And, uh, and so, you know, this is something um, very interesting going forward. And, and I think that a lot of people are going to um, appreciate having this around. So the other interesting thing about sharding is that you can deploy it with no downtime. So if you have 
a replica set with a single master that you're writing to and the load gets too high or the data set size gets too high, you can deploy sharding in front of it with no downtime. So it sort of gives you the option to scale out when you need to um, without doing it in advance and sort of having an unnecessarily complicated uh, setup. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the last sort of feature oriented slide that I wanted to go through was uh, the other cool stuff slide. So this is basically just a list of stuff um, that I'll talk about in depth if there are questions about it, but otherwise I would say definitely just know that this stuff exists and check it out if you're interested. So we do support some complex aggregation functionality, uh, primarily through a MapReduce mechanism, which we sort of recommend for doing sort of ETL or offline aggregation type uh, jobs. Um, we have these things called cap collections, which are basically fixed size collections with automatic rollout. So these are great for doing uh, things like logging. So you could create a fixed size log and you can just keep writing to it. And once it fills up, it'll just wrap around and start overwriting the old data automatically. So uh, it's sort of low administration overhead there. Um, we support unique indexes. So you can, when you create an index, you can say, uh, create an additional unique constraint on it. Um, and it's just a way to get a little bit more structure on your collections. And we support this thing called GridFS, which is basically a uh, file system like API built on top of MongoDB. So it's a mechanism for storing large binary data in MongoDB by chunking it up into smaller documents and storing those documents in, in Mongo. And um, basically it's just a standard for doing that. So all of the drivers and tools can support this mechanism. And uh, there have been some interesting tools written around that. So for example, one project uh, is an Nginx file handle, handler that will automatically serve files uh, from GridFS straight through Nginx without having to hit your uh, application server at all. So there's all sorts of interesting things that have been built around that. Um, one nice thing about storing your files in the database is that if you've already set up sharding or replication, you can sort of leverage that for your file storage as well. Um, so that's why I think a lot of people are considering using it. Uh, and then lastly, geospatial indexing. So MongoDB supports uh, two-dimensional geospatial indexes as well, um, which lets you do stuff like, hey, find me all of the locations that are near this location or um, you know, find me all the bars that are near where I am right now. And actually, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, this is a feature that Foursquare is using um, to find locations when you go to check in on Foursquare. So they're using MongoDB and they're using these geospatial indexes. Um, a couple quick notes before we start doing questions is that there are a bunch of upcoming events, um, Mongo specific events. So if you happen to be in Boston or Berlin or Chicago in the, in the next couple of months, um, definitely check out these events, uh, tenj.com slash events. Um, and, you know, generally we get a couple of speakers from Tengen and a couple of uh, external contributors and a couple of users to all come and talk and, and they tend to be a lot of fun. So check those out um, if you can. And then lastly, if I can change slides here, um, it would be great if you guys could all download MongoDB and, and sort of let us know what you think. So if you haven't already, check it out um, and, and let us know how, how it goes. And let's get right into questions because I know there's been a, a bunch of them. So um, I'm not sure if Catherine wanted to um, moderate these or if I should just read them off of the list, whatever works. Hey, Mike, it's up to you. If, if you can hear me, Mike, it's up to you because I have a feeling that I would mangle a lot of these questions <laughs> if I tried to read them. OK, how about, how so, about I'll, just, um, I'll just read, what them, would you and prefer? Then read them and then answer them. Um, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce OK, they're in chronological names. order. Okay, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce people's names, so don't, don't be offended that I don't say your name. Uh, I'm just scared I'll, I'll butcher all of them. Um, so the first question was, why don't we just use a UUID or a GUID instead of object ID format? Um, and that's a good question. I think that those would work fine too. Um, we settle on object ID basically because it's a little bit more lightweight, so it's 12 bytes instead of 16, and since uh, these things are in every single document that actually can add up um, to some decent space savings. But uh, object IDs are also really, really fast to generate. Um, and since we need to generate one for every insert, um, that's important as well. Okay, so 
Uh, there is a question about finding tags. So the question was db.post.find where tags is intro. And I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but basically the way that, that querying on arrays works is exactly the way that querying on a scalar value works. So if you want to find the, any post where the tag is MongoDB, you just say tags uh, colon MongoDB. And we're actually going to look through each of those tags and look one by one for a match. Um, and so that's that's how that works and tends to you know be pretty lightweight and easy to easy to generate queries that way um, okay so the next question was about the underscore ID counter um, so that is actually not generated by the database server the underscore ID is completely generated on the client side um, and yeah each document when you when you generate a new object ID it's going to just increment that counter by one just to give us uniqueness within an individual second um, but the reason we generate those on the client side is basically we try as much as possible to push work out from the database server and into the clients. And that's because that, um, you know, even though MongoDB is scalable and easy to scale out, it's still always easy, easier to scale at the application layer where things are stateless than to scale at the database layer. So we try to push as much work as possible to the, to the client drivers. So that's just one example of that. Um, Michael Ritchie asked, do you need the variable or can you just embed the date? And the answer is, yeah, you can just embed the date. I, I just separated it out onto two lines to uh, make things easier to read. Um, Patrick asks, if there is a functional limit or recommended best practice for maximum document size? And the answer is that right now, documents are limited uh, to four megabytes total size. Um, so there's no limit on the nested depth or any of the complexity of a document or anything like that, but there is a hard limit of four megabytes in the document size. And that's sort of an arbitrary limit. So there's no real technical limitation that says that we need it to be four megs. Um, but the reason we limit it to four megs is because, first of all, that guarantees us some predictability of performance. Um, so by keeping documents a little bit smaller, we get, we get some more assurances that, that things are going to perform reasonably well and reasonably consistently. Um, and also, if your documents are much larger than four megs, chances are you're doing something uh, inefficiently in terms of your schema. So four megs is pretty big. I think the entire text of War of the Worlds is like a couple hundred K. So, so four megs is, is a pretty huge document size. Um, well, actually, probably it'll it'll probably be expanded in the coming uh, coming releases to something like 32 megs or something like that. But um, it's sort of an arbitrary limit, but it's generally a good idea. Small documents are, are generally easier to work with. Um, Mark asks, is the index created when a document is inserted into the database? Um, so yeah, indexes are um, indexes are created. Uh, when you specify, when you send that create index um, message. So when you actually call the create index function, we're going to create the index. And then every time you insert a new document, we're going to update that index uh, as you insert it. Or when you update or delete a document, we'll update the indexes, you know, right then, right then and there. Um, so that's how that works. Pretty traditional. Um, so, sorry, this question isn't going to make sense if I read it, but Bruno asks, on a document uh, that has the embedded structured terms, where the terms embedded document has a foo key, how can you query for the foo term? And the answer is that you would, you would use that dot notation. So you would say, give me the documents where terms.foo is whatever value you want. So that dot notation is how we say reach inside of uh, an embedded document. Um, Vincent asks if there's a config option to require a response from the server that the write was successful. Um, yes, so all of the drivers support a mechanism for tacking on a query onto the end of an update message that basically says, hey, did this succeed? And, um, and all the drivers make that easy to do. Um, there is a performance hit there. So you're, you're then you're going to be blocking on every single update um, and waiting for the server response. Um, Inserts to, and updates still tend to be pretty quick in Mongo, so it should still perform reasonably well, but it, it will uh, obviously perform less well than doing all the inserts uh, without waiting for response. And then, you know, one thing you can do is do 
100 inserts and then do one uh, check to say, hey, did all those succeed? And then do the, the next 100 insert, inserts and then do a check. And, uh, you know, that's a good way to, to approach it as well. Um, Pinda Aster, you know, one and zero. So one means I can become primary and zero means I will never become primary. I'm just sort of a, a, always going to be just a secondary node. Um, in the future, that will be expanded. So you could imagine having uh, a couple nodes with priority one that could all take over and maybe a node with uh, priority 0 0.5 that could be in a remote data center and just for disaster recovery. And that will take over only if uh, none of the one nodes are online and then maybe a node with zero priority as well. So there is that notion of, of setting the priority of a node. Um, is there metadata such as size and number of docs, Steve asks. Um, Steve, maybe if you can follow up with a little bit more information about what you're wondering. Um, so you can get, there are easy ways to get statistics about a collection um, or database, such as you know how many documents are in a collection, what's the uh, size on disk of the documents in the collection, index sizes, that sort of thing. So if you have a more specific question, uh, follow up. Um, Darm asks a good question. What storage engine does it use? And is it different from InnoDB? Um, yeah, so the storage engine we use is actually our own storage engine. And basically the way it works is that um, it's a memory map storage engine. And we basically, well, here, I'll sh I have a couple slides that we can run through real quick. So. Uh, everybody start watching again. Um, so the way it works is that we allocate these data files per database. Um, so you'll see if you start working with MongoDB in your data directory, data directory, you'll see uh, some files like this. And there's a, a single .ns file, and then there'll be a bunch of incrementing files. So foo.0, foo.1, foo.2, and those are named per database. So this is for the foo database. Um, and those will double in size with each um, new allocation. Uh, up to two gigabytes. So once you get up to two gigs, we'll just keep allocating new two gigabyte files. And so that's where the data is actually stored. And then within those files, um, we basically just memory map the entire file, the entire, you know, we just memory map all of the storage that we've allocated. And then within those files, we, we allocate space into what are called namespaces. So namespaces are per collection and they also sort of grow in size, like uh, just like the database does. They just start a little bit smaller, um, but then they sort of, uh, exponentially grow in size um, as as a collection needs more and more space. So um, when we when we insert into a new collection, first we'll allocate an extent for that collection, um, and then we will just insert into that. And once that extent fills up, we'll allocate a new one. Um, and so you can see that in those data files, um, there are a couple interesting notes. So first of all, we keep around a free list of extents. So when you drop a collection, basically all we do is free those extents. Um, so it's a pretty fast operation. And then for future collections, we'll try to reuse those, those extents that are on the free list. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that we pre-allocate a ton of space. So you'll see that that entire foo.2 data file is all empty. Um, so we basically will always keep a, an empty data file. And that's so that we hopefully never have to block on allocation. So as soon as you fill up foo.1, we'll actually start pre-allocating foo.3 even though you're just starting to use foo.2. Um, and so that way we'll always keep an empty file around. And then basically all of the metadata about those namespaces is stored in that in that .ns file, um, which is basically just a hash table. So that's how that works. Um, that's a really quick explanation, but I want to get to some more of these questions. Um, Bruno asks, how many people work on MongoDB development? Um, how many from TenGen and how many from the community? So TenGen, I think we're up to about 12 full-time developers right now, and, and everybody here is working on Mongo in one way or another. And there are a bunch of people working on it from the community as well. So, um, you know, everything's open source, and you'll see that, you know, in the server, there's been a, a ton of contributions. There's probably been an order of magnitude more contributions to the various drivers. Um, and then if you look on top of the drivers, there's been all tons of tools written, things like Mongo Mapper or Mongoid, if you're coming from Ruby. Uh, things like PHP Moadmin, which is a, you know, an admin interface to Mongo. And there are just a ton of projects like that. And those are almost all coming from the community. So there's a, a bunch of developers who are working on this who aren't employed by Tengen as well. Um, 
Tension is actually hiring as well, though, so you guys should check that out if you're if you're interested in working on Mongo. Um, can you have a local replica to support disconnect, disconnected data, um, a replica or shard that is only available to you? Um, so you can't really. What you can do is that each um, each node in a replica set has a database called local, and that contains collections that are local to that database um, and will never be replicated. So you could actually uh, imagine doing some interesting things with that local database. Um, Brad asks if embedded documents count towards the four, megabit, four megabyte doc size. Uh, yes, they do. So um, basically, all of those embedded documents, when they get converted to BSON, they're all going to be in one single BSON document. And if you look at the BSON spec site, you'll see how that how that looks. Um, but all of those documents, sort of the sum of the size of the outer document, is what is subject to the four megabyte limit. So all of the embedded documents have to fit within that four four megabytes. Um, Bruno asks about doing joins and, and how do you deal with that. Um, my approach has been uh, that you can do you can do sort of referencing, which is sort of uh, like doing a join, basically like a client side join. So you can reference a document by storing its underscore ID, right? So you could imagine um, if I had blog posts and authors, each post could store an author ID that points back to the author collection or the, the author in the author collection. Um, and then I could get my blog post and then I could take that ID and go get my author and you know I sort of just did a client side join there. Um, and that's fine. So I think my approach with with modeling is tends to be um, start with this fully normalized approach where I'm just referencing everything um, sort of like I would do in a relational database and then embed wherever it makes sense. So there are, are, there are a bunch of cases where it makes sense to embed things like tags, uh, things like comments in, in a blog post. Those are pretty natural use cases for this embedded functionality. So sort of um, that's, that's how I've gone about modeling it and that, that tends to work pretty well. Um, Gordon asks how Mongo compares to Couch. So they're pretty similar. Uh, I, can, I can talk about a couple of the differences off the top of my head. So one difference is that um, the way that queries work is pretty different. So MongoDB uses sort of a traditional uh, dynamic query mechanism and CouchDB uses basically this view-based uh, MapReduce sort of, sort of like custom index building approach where you define MapReduce functions that get applied to documents as they're updated and, uh, and they're basically like views, like, like predefined queries. Um, so I think MongoDB is a little bit more traditional in that way. Um, the, the CouchDB mechanism is definitely cool. Um, I think, in general, I think a lot of people uh, tend to be more comfortable with the MongoDB approach. Um, that's one difference. Uh, another difference is that CouchDB supports master-master replication. Um, we don't. So, um, so if you need to do sort of this offline syncing type thing, um, CouchDB is probably a good fit for that. For general purpose web applications, I think MongoDB tends to be fine um, and, and tends to work really well. Um, and lastly, I think there's probably some um, performance differences as well. Um, and, you know, I'll let you guys, you know, check that out for yourself. Um, yeah, so we're getting close to time. So I, I, th I guess I'll just pick um, a couple more questions. And if there are more questions, uh, people can follow up offline or um, there's, Christina is also going to be doing an upcoming webcast with O'Reilly, so you can stay tuned for that. Um, but definitely, you know, there are all sorts of avenues for, for getting in touch with us. So feel free to, to do that if I didn't get to one of, to one of your questions in time. Um, so let's, uh, let's check out, uh, let's do one more question here. Um, so there is a question. Um, oh, is the Mongo site running on MongoDB? Um, the answer, it, that's a good question, that's funny. Um, so the, the answer is yes, so sort of. Um, if you look at the docs, we're actually using uh, Confluence, Alice in Confluence, which isn't using MongoDB yet, unfortunately. Um, but the sort of the landing page and the home page for, for uh, the MongoDB site, so it's sort of split up into two, uh, two different systems. And the landing page and all that stuff does use MongoDB. So we store things like our download metadata in MongoDB. Um, the Tangent site uses MongoDB a bunch as well. Um, what, that was sort of a, a bogus question. So one more quick one. Does MongoDB have full text search? Um, no. So we don't have 
built-in full text search yet. Uh, it tends to be pretty easy to hook Mongo up to an external full text search engine. Um, we also have that multi keys thing, which, which lets you sort of fake some basic full text search uh, pretty easily. And, um, and we're going to be looking at, at what we could do to add some sort of basic full text search uh, functionality into Mongo um, in the upcoming releases. So there's a case open in our bug tracker for that. So you should go uh, comment on that there if you have thoughts. Um, but currently, uh, currently the best bet if you really need complex full text search is probably to hook up to, uh, you know, something like Lucene or Sphinx or, or something like that, Solar, whatever. Um, Okay, guys, I have had a lot of fun here. Hopefully I answered uh, some of you guys' questions, and, and, and hopefully all of you guys, if you haven't already, will uh, go give MongoDB a try. And, um, and, you know, like I said, feel free to get in touch if we have any questions or if there's anything we can help you guys with. That was a very impressive job, Mike. I've never seen anyone answer questions so easily and so flawlessly. So. <laughs> quite impressive. Thanks for the great webcast. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. And I also want to say uh, Christina's webcast is on September 17th, so if you want to, I think Mary posted the link to it, but you can go uh, check it out on our webcast page, which is O'Reilly.com slash webcast, where we have a listing of all of them. Tomorrow we have a CouchDB webcast, if you want to check that out and compare. But um, I hope you'll join us for Christina's webcast and check out their book, um, with MongoDB, The Definitive Guide, when it comes out in September. So once again, thank you so much, Mike. And thank you, everyone, yeah, for joining us today. Yeah, a lot of fun. Today. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just wait about 10 seconds and then close out this room. And like I said, we'll send everyone a link with the um, – recording, a link to the recording as soon as we have that available. And that will probably be a day or two, but we'll get that to you. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for uh, participating today. Goodbye. <laughs>